Good evening, and welcome to tonight's program, Witness for My Father with Barbara Berggren. My name is Erin Blankenship, and I have the great honor of being the Director of Collections and Interpretation at the Florida Holocaust Museum. If you've hung with us for the last um, 10 or 15 minutes uh, because of our technical dif difficulties, I want to thank you and apologize. We were having some issues with Facebook, but we're here now, so thank you. Before we hear from Barbara, I wanted to let you know that her book, Witness for My Father, is available for purchase at barbarabergren.com, and I will share that link in the comments in a few moments. Also, we're so glad that you're watching this evening and would appreciate your feedback on this program. So we are asking that you follow the link provided in the description of tonight's event um, that will take you to our survey and tell us what you think. Your feedback helps us when we apply for grants so that we can bring you the great programming that we bring you like tonight's talk and help us plan uh, for future events as well. So after we hear from our speaker, please stay tuned until after our talk and she will take some questions about her book and about her father's story. And you can simply type your questions into the comment section here on Facebook under the video. 2020 marks 75 years since the liberation of the last concentration camp. And today we are faced with the reality that we will soon live in a world with no living Holocaust survivors. That's one reason why we have begun to engage with the children of Holocaust survivors, the second generation, and have asked them to carry on their parents' legacies by sharing their stories. So tonight we are so pleased to have Barbara here to share her father's experience with you. To introduce our speaker, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Charlene Wygotsky. Dr. Wygotsky is a life member of the Florida Holocaust Museum and a board member of the museum's Generation After Group, a group of children and grandchildren of survivors. Like Barbara, Dr. Wygotsky has also begun sharing her mother's story with groups at the museum. And personally, I'm so thankful to know her and to have worked with her on various collections projects over the years. I'd also like to add that we are tremendously grateful to Generations After for their sponsorship of this program. So now I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Charlene Wygotsky. Thank you, Erin. I am very excited and honored to introduce our speaker today, Barbara Bergen. Barbara earned her MBA from the University of Hartford and worked in finance for 25 years. She is now an author, lecturer, and Holocaust educator who visits schools, religious organizations, and community groups speaking about her father's experience during and after the Holocaust. Her book, Witness for My Father, is a story of how an African-American troop broke the rules and nurtured her father after his liberation from Dachau. Her book was just launched in January and is already winning awards. Barbara's father, Martin Weigand, was only 11 when the Nazis invaded his hometown of Starowice in Poland. He survived the death march from Auschwitz, imprisonment at Buchenwald, the deaths of his family before his liberation from Dachau, and the decision that changed the course of his life. He would never speak of it. It was a surprise telephone call 50 years later that opened the door to Martin's past. We were very fortunate several years ago when Barbara decided to join our local Generations After, a group for children and descendants of Holocaust survivors and share her story with us. Our usual introduction at meetings is to compare notes about our family, where our parents are from, where they were during the war, and what they did after liberation. The stories are often difficult to hear, and I had heard many over the years, but not one quite like Barbara's. She mentioned that her father's story was published on the front page of the Wall Street Journal in 2003. It certainly piqued my interest, and I wanted to know more. As a subscriber to the paper, I searched and searched, in the archives until I finally found it. It brought tears to my eyes and I couldn't wait for her book to be completed as she was still writing it. 
Witness for My Father is an amazing tribute to Barbara's dad. It is engaging, moving, a beautifully written story, one you cannot put down once you start. I speak on behalf of the second generation friends with great admiration on what she has accomplished through the many dedicated years of researching and writing this book. It is a true testament in keeping Martin's legacy alive and a story not to be forgotten. Please help me welcome my fellow 2G and my dear friend, Barbara Berggren. Thank you, Erin, and thank you, Charlene. Um, first of all, I'm just so truly privileged to be here at the Florida Holocaust Museum to share my book, Witness for My Father. It is a privilege. Erin, I appreciate uh, the introduction today. And Charlene, my uh, second generation, as we call it, um, what a wonderful friend. She has embraced me and helped me for years to incorporate our mission together um, as a group and has been supportive. And our mission is to educate the students, to educate the community. And the group itself, the Generations After group, has also become a support for one another. So I'm just so grateful for everything you've done, Charlene. Thank you. Um, October marks a personal time of remembrance for me, and I'll get back to that a little bit later. But I want to thank everyone in the museum for having the opportunity today to share my father's story. Um, the slide, Witness for My Father, that is my book, and the photo there is my father and myself. I'm probably about six years old, close to six, and that picture was taken in Europe. Um, the other picture I thought would be nice to see us grown up and we are at an event together and that is my father again and Martin Wagen and myself. We launched the book on January 27th, which was International Holocaust Remembrance Day. This story honors those who perished, our survivors and liberators of the Holocaust. Next please. This year marks 75 years since the camps were liberated, a reminder that we need to continue to pass our history along. Survivors and liberators won't be here to share their stories, unfortunately in under a decade, I believe. Death from natural causes has to be accepted, but when murder becomes accepted and disguised as a war, then we have a problem, a human problem. For me, it's personal, for the second generation it's personal, but for the world, I believe it's necessary. I'm going to share an extraordinary story with you today. It's about the worst and the best of humanity. It's about an act of kindness. I'm going to introduce you to another U.S. Army Lieutenant whose Quartermaster Truck Company brought supplies to the Dachau camp soon after the liberation. And the slide you can see, um, I visited Dachau with my husband a few years ago and the artwork was just stunning. Um, and you can see in the upper left corner, it says uh, another memorial on the Dachau grounds is never again in many different languages. Next slide, please. A little bit about me. I believe things happen for a reason. I was born in Israel and came to the U.S. with my parents when I was six. This is a photo taken in Israel. Um, that is my mother, she's Margareta, and in Israel they called her Hannah. That is me, born Sonia Barbara. Um, I think I'm about two years old there, almost two. And that's my dad. Um, if you notice on his shoulder, there's an owl insignia because he was serving in the Israeli Defense Forces. Um, my brother, Ed, was born when I was 10. And as a teenager, I knew I had to write my parents' incredible story. But little did I know that more of my dad's story would unfold. And not until I was a, an adult. In fact, I was an adult with grown children. It was a gift. And through my father's testimony and other survivor testimonies and interviews, many documents and lots of research, um, I took a trip to Poland with my husband, Germany, and Israel and I was able to piece together dad's history. And now I'm honored to share my father's story. Witness from my father introduces you to his family 
and follows his journey through World War II and post-war era. Next, please. Martin Weigand, my dad. It all began on April 3rd, 2001, a day that changed my life. I was working late with my father in our family business, and he mentioned that an old hometown friend had given him a call and said somebody was just looking for him and had gone all over and finally had contacted him. So dad handed me an index card with an out of state number. I had no idea who this was and neither did he. And there was a name on it that just didn't ring a bell, Wickers. Dad wore a hearing aid at this point, so I said I would help stay on the line. And he said suddenly, let's do it now. So I was taken aback. He's a very cautious man, taught me to be the same, but I figured he had thought this through. I dialed the number and I asked for Mr. Wickers, who corrected me and said, Mr. Withers. And I explained very quickly that I thought he was looking for Martin Wigan. And there was silence. Um, I think he felt he had passed. The man's name on the phone was John Withers II, and he said, I've been looking for your father for over two years. I was clueless. My dad's on the extension, I told him, and then dad suddenly injected, are you the son of Lieutenant Withers, um, John Withers? I hadn't heard that name before. Yes, answered John, that's my father. I grew up on your story, Martin. And I'm thinking to myself, what story? I looked at my father. We finished the phone call. We agreed we would get in touch with the gentleman, John Withers too. And I looked at my dad and I said, what on earth? I ne had never heard this story before. Who's Lieutenant Withers? So my dad very simply got up from his desk, stood up, put his hand behind his neck and kind of pulled up on his collar and looked at me and said, Barb, that's what he called me. Says he, Lieutenant Withers and his men put me back on my feet. And that's when I knew this was a chapter from his Holocaust history. Next slide. Let's go back in time. Meet my father and his family. Over here to the left, um, my father was Mieczysław Weigensberg. They called him Mietek for short. There he is, uh, not quite five years old, really styling it. Um, his mother is uh, sitting down. She's um, got the baby on her lap and his mother, Sonia, my grandmother. And that is Clara, who's not, <clears throat> not quite a year old yet with a K and Isaac, his father, my grandfather. Next, please. This photo was taken in Wierzchnik, the new, the Jewish section in the town of Starohowice, Poland. My father, his sister Clara and their parents, Isaac and Sonia, celebrated New Year's Eve at their neighbor's house, the Lox, the L-A-K-S, the Loxes. As you can see, they had good food, drink, they played music, and dad was about 10, his sister was seven. And at the time, at midnight, they were asleep when this photo was taken, but the daughter, um, who was their age, who they played with, and was a good friend of my father's, her name was Renya, she slipped down and she got into the picture. She becomes an important part of the story as well. Um, I'd like to introduce them to you. Uh, in the photo from the far left, the second person in is Isaac, my grandfather, next to him, to his, um, third person in from the left is Pola Lox, the hostess, and there's Renya, their, her daughter, and next to her is her father, Isaac with a C, and behind him, the lady raising her glass, giving the toast, is my grandmother, Sonia. Next, please. Every year, Dad and his family vacationed at their lake house with family and with neighbors. He loved it. They swam, they rode boats, they fished, and they actually danced on their porches. Um, I would like to, let me introduce the people I do know in the picture. Um, in the slide, sitting down to the far left with a big white boat, that is Clara, his sister. I don't know the lady next to her. The other one is uh, next to the 
uh, person sitting there is Isaac, my grandfather, and Sonia, uh, my grandmother, leaning on him. And again, to the right on sitting down is Renya again. Uh, the, there are two late, two gals in the back standing up that her, are her sisters. So there are three Lox daughters. One is second from the left, and the other one is the fifth one in in the center. This unfortunately would be their last summer vacation together. Next, please. That's September 1939, the Germans invaded Poland. In a short time, in fact, within a month's time, all the rules changed. Dad, his family, and Jewish friends weren't allowed to ride public transportation. They couldn't attend school. They had curfews. And months later, Dad and his family were forced to take their belongings and leave their two-story home to live in a crowded ghetto. This photo, uh, this slide was taken in the ghetto and my father is reading to his sister, Clara. He had a love of books and a love for reading. My grandparents, Isaac and Sonia, hired a tutor for dad and Clara. Isaac had to work in a factory where they made ammunition parts. Um, and by the way, that factory was a, a really important part of keeping Starahowitze alive because it was, its history was metallurgy and works, uh, factory work. And so they could convert it to a munitions factory for the war effort. They had to barter for food and supplies because money really had no value in the ghetto. And soon dad had to work long hours at a factory as well. Sonia had to work at a brick factory and Clara had to stay alone. She was only nine years old. So life was extremely hard, but the family was together. Next slide. Until October 27th, 1942. I mentioned earlier that uh, this was a very special month of remembrance. I'm uh, grateful that the museum had October uh, for our day to um, have the presentation. That day ushered in a nightmare. It's selection day. Um, I burn a candle at the, on October 27th. The ghetto was ordered outside to the market square. In the photo, that is the market square that it's called Rynek in Poland. And families were trying very hard to stay together. A specially trained Nazi unit was in charge. They shot anyone not fast enough, beat back crowds with clubs and whips, and they held tight leashes of their vicious dogs. Bodies laid everywhere. If you hear stories about Selection Day in other towns, this was typical because the, this particular unit was trained to do this in every town. The men and the women were separated. Isaac gave Mietek, my father, a brick and said, stand on this, and if asked, you're 15. Dad had just turned 14. Then the selection began. Who would stay to work and who would be sent on the transport? Sonia made the cut for working women, but the SS pulled Clara out of line, pointing to the transport. She was too young, she was 11, and the Nazis just wanted strong workers. Sonia couldn't let Clara go alone, so she stepped out of line to be with her daughter. Next, please. Dad and Isaac lined up on the far end of the square, frantically looking for them catching really only a glimpse. They were headed to the transport. The destination, Treblinka Concentration Camp, one of six killing centers. They were murdered in the gas chamber. And that is on the left, uh, Sonia, my father's mother, my grandmother, and that is a picture of Clara taken in the uh, mid thirties. Next, please. Dad was 14, Isaac was 39. They never got to say goodbye. I traveled there with my husband um, years ago and went to, drove to Treblinka, which by the way is a, just a farmland, um, very quiet setting. Even the animals, the insects, 
there's something very quiet and different in the area. Um, what they did is um, the towns that were impacted and had their um, residents transferred to Treblinka to be exterminated, a, a word I hate, uh, to be killed. They erected um, headstones and Star Huitze, the stone you see there, that's me saying, paying tribute to my grandmother and uh, to my aunt. Um, my father and his father made the cut to work and were forced to march to a labor camp in Starhowitz to work in a munitions factory. They were full-time slaves now to the Nazi regime. The filthy conditions where they had to stay, they didn't have enough sanitation, gave way to a typhus outbreak. Dad contracted typhus and later scarlet fever. Father and son slaved for two years until July, 1944. The Russians were advancing. So the uh, Nazis closed the camp, loading those who survived onto cattle cars. What they didn't know was that the transport was headed to Auschwitz. Next, please. This is a quote from my father. <clears throat> he said, um, we were loaded into closed box cars, packed tight with no food or water on board. We were packed so tight, no one could sit down. Many died. Not enough air, extremely hot, no water, so crowded. I speak at um, school systems and um, I always make sure they have a picture of Auschwitz because as we've heard, you know, they need to learn about it as well. So nobody leaves the auditorium without having seen or understood the significance of Auschwitz. Next, please. A huge complex, you can see the tower in the back there on the left. Auschwitz was like a horror movie. The prisoners looked like walking dead. The camp murdered Jews and others on arrival if they had no use for them. The gas chamber and the crematoria operated day and night. Smells were said to be a constant reminder of death. Dad and Isaac made the cut to work. Next. This is the Auschwitz, Auschwitz roster. They stood in line after being showered, disinfected, shaved, given striped prison garb. Dad was tattooed on the inside of his left arm, A19104. This is an actual roster from the camp and I have to thank my brother. He's the one who researched to get this particular um, uh, uh, Auschwitz roster. And if you can see, there's a red line and that underlines my father's registration. And you have to note that there's a G, it says Geigensberg. And what my father and his father had talked about was staying closer to their own friends from Starohuitze. Uh, they had the Gutermans, the Helsteins, and they figured this camp was so different that it was their best means of trying to stay together. You see his name, Miatek, you see his birth date, which is 11-7, which is July 11th, that's correct. But he put himself in his, the year 1926, he was born 1928. So at 16 now, he was trying to look older to be 18. And then you see Star Huitze, and in the far right is the A19104, his tattoo number. The average lifespan at Auschwitz was three months for women and six months for men. A short time later, dad was assigned to a subcamp, Buna, also known as Monowitz. Isaac was assigned to a different camp. And unfortunately, this is the first time they would be separated in five years. And by the way, Ellie Wiesel, also 16, was assigned to the same Buna camp. Despite the harsh conditions, inside work saved you. Prisoners at Auschwitz relied on word of mouth for messages. And dad got devastating news. His father, Isaac, had been shot dead. He was now an orphan. Next slide. The Russians were closing in. It was January 1945. 
the Nazis destroyed evidence of the camp. 1.25 million people had been killed here. On the 17th, the Nazis marched the strongest survivors north during one of the most bitter winters on record. This is a, um, I thought it was intriguing because the uh, survivor David Friedman painted his march. And if you note, just the shoes, they were wooden clogs. They had to all be clever. And even in my story, in my book, I explain how my father um, had to work his shoes in order to march in this icy cold weather. The Nazis shot anyone who slipped and fell or lagged behind. Miraculously, Dad and Ellie Wiesel um, barely survived the death march to a place called Gleiwitz. And a few days later, another transport arrived, taking Dad and Ellie Wiesel to another camp, Buchenwald. Author Ellie Wiesel wrote about this um, open um, transport. 20 corpses were thrown from our wagon. Then the train resumed its journey, leaving in its wake in a snowy field in Poland, hundreds of naked orphans without a tomb. Now in Buchenwald, everyone was ready to die. This is in January 45. It was only a matter of time. Barely surviving this camp, Dad was put on another cattle car transport that traveled three weeks with no food or water. The railway cars arrived at another camp near Munich, Germany on April 27th. This was Dachau. Dad weighed less than 90 pounds, and two days later, on April 29th, the American troops liberated Dachau. Next, please. Prisoners kept dying, too late for many. This is a photo of an actual Dachau, uh, one of the cars, the transport cars, and what the liberators found when they got there. A little more eyewitness and um, from the Holocaust Chronicle. The first evidence of the horror was a string of about 40 railway cars on a siding near the camp entrance. Each car was loaded with emaciated human corpses. A train had left Buchenwald three weeks earlier, carrying more than 5,000 prisoners. With few provisions, almost 2,000 inmates died during the three-week ride. <clears throat> American forces discovered more than 2,300 bodies still on the train. A mere 816 people survived the voyage. My father, Mieczysław Weigensberg, was one of the 816 that survived that ride. In a short time, Dad and other survivors were moved to a DP camp, displaced persons. An incident committed by another survivor upset him. He made a major decision and one what that would change his life again. He walked out. He walked out of the DP camp. He had nowhere to go. In his own words, I had no family, no home, no country, and no money. Weak and malnourished, he walked until he came to the US Army Troop Encampment. Soldiers washed huge pots. They were black soldiers. An African-American segregated unit. By the way, that surprised me. He gestured from his side of the fence to a couple of the soldiers. And what he didn't know was that these men were from the 3511 Quartermaster Supply Troop that had entered the Dachau camp right after it was liberated. The black soldiers knew immediately that dad was one of the Dachau survivors. They had been sickened when they entered the gates, but an army rule, no association with former prisoners of war. There were a lot of diseases and you know they didn't really know how they would cope. Next, please. I want to share some eyewitness, uh, just one slide of eyewitness um, testimony, because I think it says it way better. Um, while nothing could have prepared anyone for what lay behind the gates of Dachau and Buchenwald, African American soldiers seemed particularly affected by what they witnessed. Bob Bender, a survivor liberated from da Buchenwald, recalled the black soldiers of the US Third Army, tall and strong, crying like babies carrying the emaciated bodies of the liberated prisoners. Another person 
one of the liberators, awestruck, awestruck excuse me, by what he had seen at Buchenwald, Leon Bass of the U.S. Third Army offered this powerful observation. I came into that camp an angry black soldier, angry at my country and justifiably so, angry because they were treating me as though I was not good enough. But that day, I came to the realization that human suffering is not relegated to me and mine. I now knew that human suffering could touch us all. What I saw in Buchenwald was the face of evil. It was racism. The black soldiers broke the rule and nodded to dad to come in. They gestured him to eat and then he could work. They took a risk. Their lieutenant was away and they knew he would not approve. They gave him a nickname, Pee Wee, because they couldn't pronounce Mieczysław Weigensberg, and they took him in. They hid him. And actually soon another survivor approached my dad and asked if he could get in as well. The soldiers took him in. His name was um, Shlomo Yaskovitz, and they called him Solomon. The black troop hid both the boys and made sure they were fed and they were warm. Next. Lieutenant John Withers arrived at the Army base. He had a dream to earn his PhD and begin a new life outside the South. The GI Bill could provide that opportunity. Then he found out his men were hiding two young Jewish boys on base. And he was trying to, he was trying to help his men and cover. Um, he said, how do you think we're going to hide two Jewish boys in an all black troop on base? Well, his sergeant said, I believe they really care about these two men, sir. They would like to keep them. So Pee Wee and Solomon were brought to his office. And when John looked up, he was totally surprised because he saw two emaciated boys staring at him, trying very hard to smile. He was taken aback. They were so young and they weren't hardened men at all as he had expected. They had suffered and it struck a chord. John Withers understood the pain of discrimination. Knowing he was taking a huge risk if anyone outside his troop found out, knowing his men could be dishonorably discharged, he made a decision. They could stay. Pee Wee and Solomon were adopted into a black family. The men fed them, gave them their own rooms, their own clothes, and nurtured them back to health. Next slide. This is within a few months. That's my father actually looking healthier and it was still 1945. Next, please. That's a picture of the far left. That is the boy they called Solomon and that's my father on the right. And behind them is uh, one of the uh, soldiers who was, um, we believe was Dave, that was one of my father's favorite soldiers who took very good care of him. And to the right, those are two sergeants that are taking a photo in front of their um, sign that they were putting up in their parking lot. The orphan boys worked and felt they were part of the troop, part of a family. They had no homes to go back to. They were together for over a year, healthy and emotionally steady, Pee Wee and Solomon got an apartment in a nearby town named Bamberg, but it was very tough saying goodbye. Next slide. This is dad um, in 1947. So he's about 17 ish and he is starting his new life and you can tell he's a much healthier person now. Remember the phone call in April, 2001? Next slide, please. Three weeks after that phone call on April 27th, the date that dad arrived in Dachau, Lieutenant John Withers, his wife and daughter-in-law stepped off the plane at Bradley Airport. That's in uh, Connecticut. Dad and John recognized each other immediately. It was 55 years later. Next. That evening, we celebrated together in Westbrook, Connecticut. Um, the photo, the upper left, um, just very quickly, my father is standing on the left and to the far right is John Withers. 
seated left to right are Daisy John's wife, my brother Ed Wigan, my husband Steve, myself, and daughter-in-law Ruth, um, uh, Mary Ruth, excuse me, Mary Ruth Coleman. And you can see the other two photos. Uh, we dined in a few places and the men actually clutched each other's hands. They were so taken and um, you could tell the families, we just blended together effortlessly. Next, please. We gathered at our beach house in Westbrook the next day. Dad gave a toast and reached for his red leather bound album. Inside the cover was a picture of Lieutenant Withers and the other soldiers. And then John presented his own album, a gift from dad and the other boy Solomon with their photos. John and dad had carried these albums with them across three continents. They had been parting gifts to each other when they left um, back in 1947. Next, please. Those are um, the pictures. And John was uh, about 28, 28 to 29 years old at this point. And that's a picture of dad at 16. Next, please. This is what was written on the back. By the way, a lot of the things today are not in the book. Some of them are, some of them aren't. So I just wanted, this is one of the ones that is not. Um, if you notice in the left corner, to my good friend, John Withers, best wishes, and my father signs his name, Pee Wee Weigensberg. But in the left corner, he also says, Mieczysław Weigensberg. And that becomes critical. Um, but to the right of that photo is to my friend, Pee Wee, and it's signed John Withers. So that's on the back of both of their photos. Well, John II had taken time from his state um, department job to find dad. He was also writing a book and began asking dad questions. And he found him with only his name written on the back of this photo. So that's a very important piece. Uh, and thanks to John II, all of this came to pass. Um, my brother Ed and I were very cautious, but dad opened up more about his past, mostly after the war because if we ever approached dad for details, we, us we used to back off. Uh, we didn't want to upset him. Well, you could feel the love and the respect that dad and John had for each other. Next, please. That's uh, John on the left and dad um, on the right, Martin. That summer, John Withers and his family came to my daughter's wedding. We visited them in Maryland and we really made some wonderful memories. Then another twist, uh, John was sharing a story at another event about finding Pee Wee and that led to um, a gentleman, Brian Gruley, who's a Wall Street Journal writer and he was interested in the story. He asked to interview John and Martin for it and of course my brother and I assumed my dad would say no because we are very private people. A lot of Many of our friends didn't know about my dad's past. Well, to our surprise, dad said, if this will help John, I'll do it. Ed and I weren't sure this was a good idea, but it was dad's decision. Next slide. After dad's 75th birthday party, that's a picture of his birthday. And by the way, that is a dad with his great granddaughter, Ashley which as we know for survivors is a big deal. After that party about um, within two weeks, I picked up Brian Gruley at the airport. Ed and I would always be present, he understood. Next day, uh, Brian carefully opened a great history book asking tough questions, starting with a simple one. What did your house look like, Martin, in Star Hoitze? And did you have your own room? And I thought, wow. We never ask about the good things, and I urge anyone who has parents with any trauma, ask about the good parts, and you get to know them a little bit better. Well, yes, he and Clara had their own room. The story shared today is based on Dad's testimony and research. My brother Ed videotaped the interviews, and they became an absolute treasure.
I'd like to share a video with you next. Next slide, please. A couple of black soldiers over there. And I said, yeah, wouldn't that be nice if I could <coughs> work for them? That's how I approach whoever it was on that. I did. The only language I knew was Polish and some German. I approach him, I don't know how I, but I show him how I can wash the kettles, if I can work and do things. And he said, moment, moment, moment is mm -hmm. international. Right. And I think he brought a message and, and he looked at me. Hungry. Really? Yeah. I was hungry. These guys. That's a tough one to watch for me. Um, I wanted you to see Dad live, hear his accent and all. Um, and actually be part of the interview um, and have him tell that part of the story himself. Uh, Brian came back in August for a second interview. His hope was to return for a third one with both dad and John together, and that never happened. Dad was diagnosed with cancer in the fall and passed in October. And of course, our family was devastated, and till this day, you know, my mentor, my rock, kind, smart, wonderful man was, was gone. Next, please. On November 24th, a month after losing dad, John and Pee Wee's story ran on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. The inside page captured photos of the men and our families. You can see it's running on the left side with John's sketch. We received calls, letters, and tremendous feedback honoring our two great heroes. Kindness struck a chord in everyone. But dad wasn't here. I knew I had to carry the story, write it, pay it forward. It had to make a difference. And two years later, this part was not covered in my book. So two years later, next slide, please. The former Lieutenant John Withers and his son invited Ed and me to Washington. The US Holocaust Memorial Museum was honoring 60 years since the Holocaust. To our surprise, the chair of the event, Sarah Bloomfield, who I think is still there, welcomed everyone and went right into Dad and John's story. And we, did, we had no idea, by the way. Um, it was an honor, the story of the power of kindness and how it cut through race and religion. It is timeless. Uh, the photo on the far left, that is John II, uh, that's me. And next to me is the former Lieutenant John Withers, and next to him is my brother, Ed Wigan. So just as dinner was being served, I felt a tap on my shoulder. Hi, I'm Christine. Your dad's family were our neighbors in Star, who would say. So here we were stunned from the, you know, from the opening to this huge dinner on our story. Um, but now I'm hearing from her that uh, they were neighbors. And that's how I got the first uh, photo of New Year's Eve. Christine is Renya's sister. Well, then dinner was served. And again, someone tapped me on the shoulder. We'd like to interview and tape you and John. We're from CNN, he said, pointing to another table. Wolf Blitzer wants this story. Well, I had no idea that Wolf Blitzer was there. And next thing I knew, John and, his, and the rest of us are walking to the foyer. The cameras rolled, Brian Todd interviewed us, and on May 10th, 2005, I want to show you this video is a recap. Uh, next slide, please, and the video. World War II liberator, meet a black American veteran who risked it all to help shelter a young Jewish concentration camp survivor. That's coming up. 
Troops who survive war and return home to resume a normal life carry with them lifelong memories. On this 60th anniversary of the end of World War II in Europe, CNN's Brian Todd has a remarkable story of one GI and the friend he simply called Pee Wee. Brian's joining us now live from the World War II Memorial here in Washington. Brian? Well, this story is about two people who seemingly couldn't be more different, but who found common ground at a crucial time. When you speak to John Withers, the phrase war hero doesn't immediately come to mind. The retired State Department diplomat is self-effacing and bookish, much the same as he was 60 years ago. Spring 1945, 28-year-old Lieutenant John Withers commands a truck convoy ferrying supplies to the front lines, a company of all-black soldiers in a segregated army. under strict orders do not take in displaced camp survivors wandering around allied commanders fear survivors from the nearby Dachau camp will spread disease if they travel with convoys lieutenant withers is prepared to carry out those orders one day when two young boys beg his soldiers for shelter my intention was to immediately call the MPs and have him sent forever that's until he actually sees them one of them, a 16-year-old Polish Jew named Mieczysław Weikensberg, later says he'd appealed to the black soldiers for help because he knew they had faced discrimination and might be sympathetic. For more than a year, these men house, clothe, feed, and teach the boy, who they call Pee-wee because of his unpronounceable name. Their commander knows he's taking an enormous risk. I even could have gotten a, a dishonorable discharge. And imagine a black soldier coming back to the south where my home was with a dishonorable or a less than honorable discharge. Withers, his men, and Pee Wee make it to war's end undetected. When Withers rotates back to the U.S., the two never expect to see each other again. Decades later, after hearing all the stories, Withers' oldest son decides he'll try to track down Pee Wee. He finds him in Connecticut. He had changed his name to Martin Wigan and become a successful businessman. The boy named Pee Wee and the lieutenant who took him in are reunited after 55 years. Withers, now 88, hasn't forgotten the lesson taught to him by this young survivor, simply by his demeanor. You must not fall into this intense anger because if you are uh, against the sufferings and the things that have been done to you. Instead, you have to resolve it within yourself. The two men and their families spend two valuable years visiting, catching up. Martin Wigan, who insisted that Withers still call him Pee Wee, died in 2003. John Withers, who 60 years earlier had given a young man the home he so desperately needed, now comforts that man's children. I have to hug him, I have to kiss him. Um, we look at him, um, he's, he's one of our heroes. He's a very kind person, he's a gentle person, that's how our father was too. Martin Wigan's children say as long as they were growing up, he barely mentioned his experience even when they pressed him on it. But after that reunion with John Withers in 2001, and especially in Withers' presence, he opened up. Wolf. Brian Todd, a beautiful story indeed. Thanks very much for reporting it, Brian Todd, at the World War II Memorial here in Washington. Things happen for a reason. Spread the story, share the lesson. I believe each and every one of us can make a difference in our neighborhood, in our country, in our world. Dad and John were discriminated against for their religion and race. They chose to rise above it. They chose to be kind and help others because they knew what hatred, bullying, and indifference could do. And truly, they continue throughout the rest of their lives to help other people. I believe the majority of everyone all over the world, we are filled with goodness. They love their families, they want to keep their kids safe, and at our core, we are all the same. We may look different, 
We may practice different faiths. We have different opinions. But we are all human, human beings. And we aren't born to hate. Next slide, please. I've visited Rania Lux numerous times in New York City. She helped me color star Huitze. She helped with war details. And Renya and her two sisters are survivors. And I'm honored to spend time with them. So I'd like to close with this photo. Uh, that is Renya there on the left. And we were visiting her in her home in the city. Um, and that is me in the center and um, my editor who lived in her neighborhood, uh, Brenda Copeland. Thank you. And by the way, it's Renya Lockskeld now because she deserves the credit. Thank you for coming today and allowing me to share witness for my father and my family's Holocaust history. Let's remember all those whose lives were cut short, whose futures and talents were stolen through mass genocide. Never forget and never forget the power of an act of kindness. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Barbara. Your father's story is incredible. We're so grateful to have you here. Um, I know right now you are um, willing to take some questions. And so if you do have um, questions, please feel free to add them in the comment section just below the video here. Um, the first question to come in is, uh, when you speak in schools or at other venues, what is the main message you want to deliver to your audience about your father's experience and the Holocaust? Um, that's, that's a great question. One of my main missions um, in life really was to connect on the school level. Um, I think the biggest issue when I enter the schools is that um, I'm sharing one person's story and you know, we know about the six million you know, people who were unfortunately murdered through the Holocaust. And I believe it really connects. Um, so we go into one story, I introduce them very much like today so they get a feel. Um, we also, part of the mission uh, really is to discuss um, surviving anything traumatic. Uh, Anti-bullying is a real big theme because clearly, you know, we have that going on today. Um, and the dehumanization that I share with the uh, kids, they, they pick up on that. It's about resilience and about moving forward and getting past that. Um, I'm really impressed with the uh, kids. And I, um, I also really believe that uh, there's been a lot of, um, uh, actually in the press and all about um, how much the kids know about the Holocaust today. So we make sure when I speak with them that when they leave, number one, they know what Auschwitz looks like, the tower. Um, also, they have a story and they, their questions um, are uh, remarkable. And my feeling is as they leave, um, even if a handful shares it, friends, family, whatever, the story lives on. And to me, part of um, the fact that the kids today don't always know about the Holocaust is just the education part, which is, I mean, the museum does a phenomenal job with the education. And so I tried to do my part on a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so that's really the, the message is that they understand what really happened and they are taken in by knowing one person's story. It's a person I, I love. Right, one, each person's story is so important and that's definitely the way uh, to connect best with people. Um, one of our viewers asks, why do you think he kept this secret from you for, and your brother for so long? Well, from what I understand, uh, at, as, a, you know, as a child growing up, I just, accepted that um, and I didn't want to press him. My brother and I felt it was a torture to press him on it. And clearly because he was orphaned and lost his family, he 
didn't want to go back to it. And he also taught me part of life, you know, especially after trauma is to just move forward and not look back. Um, but I have heard many people share uh, their parent or parents, uh, survivors, never got the story. I got the story, you know, we did because of the um, obvious and thanks to John II for looking for my dad. Um, there are some who speak to it, but that was not unusual. And really it's, you know, your parent has been tortured and you don't want to go there. You don't want to push him. And it was very hard for my father to talk about it. I'm sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, another story, um, another question we have rather is uh, considering the increase in anti-Semitism and the state of racism in the United States today, what message of hope can we learn from your father's story? Uh, that's a big question. Um, uh, part of it is the perseverance. Um, uh, one of the lessons my dad did share with me was, um, and he really pushed this all my life, was to, to judge people by their character. And what that really is about, um, I'll, I'll sidetrack to a very quick um, story that goes along with the judging of character. John II had actually asked, because he was writing too, he had asked him about African-Americans and he had never met an African-American. And yet, you know, in the camps, they met all sorts of people. But there was one prisoner of war who was um, an Uzbek, a Central Asian, dark-skinned prisoner who was Muslim and shared his bread with my father, which is why my father judges character versus nationality, race, wealth. And that was my lesson. Very hard dating too, because <laughs> you had to have good character to walk into our home. Um, so the, but to, to get back to, um, I believe going back to the school systems, it's education. I think um, this is just my own world, but anti-Semitism and racism, you have to start very young. There is a reason I don't believe, you know, I really don't believe we're born to hate. So it's something that comes out and there's a, a very fine, lane that they move in. I think we need to be more open. Uh, we all have our tribes, our clans, we have our traditions, and they are sacred. I do think we need to have more dialogue, bridge the gap. Um, even the, the museum has done when you did beaches, benches, and boycotts, that's closing the gap, opening conversation. You 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 sacredly hold on to your own traditions and um but having dialogue and creating a bridge um and i think it's part of it is just to educate and to understand and to be with one another um that's the best i have on a very big question in a short time right now so great great answer um another viewer asks how was your dad able to keep family pictures from before the war, from before the war, and how did they survive? So that's a great question. Um, there, my understanding is that they had relatives in Israel who had moved before the war. And some of, uh, even uh, when I mentioned Renya, she also had one of, um, she knew people there and they sent those pictures back. So they didn't actually have them with them during of the war, but they were taken at um, different times during that era and sent abroad. And then they came back. I've heard that from other survivors too. So, <laughs> um, okay, I think this will, this is our last question. We only have time for this last question. Um, this one is how, or I'm sorry, has your father's story been optioned or considered for a movie? Oh, wow. Um, I've heard that before. Um, I believe, uh, I, I have heard that 
haven't crossed that bridge yet. And I think it's probably um, uh, because the book was just published in January. And you need to uh, know a few people, I believe, to move that forward. Uh, But um, there was someone way back when when the story uh, came out, and but it was a local person, um, a small filmmaker who reached out to my brother and I. We were really raw at the time. We had lost our dad. Uh, but let's see if the story gets out there. But no, not, not at this time. Right. Um, but before we go, I do want to, first of all, last question. I want to thank you, Aaron, for opening and putting this together. And everyone on your team um, at the museum has been fabulous. Uh, thank you, Charlene, for a lovely opening. Uh, dear friend, and to the Generations After group that has become like extended family to me as well. And for all my support uh, for this book, I just want to really thank, and the museum, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to share this today through um, the museum and through all your help. So thank you so much. Thank you. It really is our honor to be able to um, share your, your family's story. And hopefully we'll get to do that you know, even far, far into the future. So thank you so much. Um, And if uh, you didn't get a chance to watch this whole program, it will be available on Facebook after, after this evening. And please, again, if you would like to purchase Barbara's book, you can go to her website, barbarabergren.com. Or um, if you haven't yet and would like to complete our survey, please do so at the link provided in the description for this event. So thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Good night.